Are you sure? Oh no, that's cool. That's cool. How old is your beloved daughter, man? Ooh, kindergarten, huh? Jump right in, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Recalling where we were last week and talking about Romanticism, capital R, Romanticism, small r with a S, but keeping in mind the central tropes of transformation over against conformity, revolution over against tinkering and very deep education over against very, very thin schooling. And Emerson, of course, is not only inimitable, he's the one and only, he's one of the founders, as Harold Bloom has said, for the last 35 years of so-called American religion. And the American religion, in many ways, is one of radical self-construction, radical self-fashioning, radical self-creation obsessed with newness and novelty and focused primarily on transition, making the moves, especially ascending, especially to not just the new but the better. You see it in that last paragraph of F. Scott Fitzgerald's great Gatsby. It said, Gatsby believed in what? The green light. What is the green light? That tomorrow would be better. Tomorrow would be bigger. Tomorrow would be grander. It's this fetishizing of futurity, ascribing magical power to the future. And it's no accident that the indigenous American philosophical tradition of pragmatism that flows very much through Ralph Emerson is preoccupied not with origins, beginnings, grounds, but with results, consequences, something in the future. The promissory character of reality. Promise is always at its center. Now, Emerson himself was called by one of his good friends, Bronson Alcott, uh, the Plotinus Montaigne of America. This is a way of talking about the American Montaigne with a dose of Neoplatonism, with a dose of Plotinus. Now, I think that's, that's wrong. I don't think there is an American Montaigne. That's like looking for an American Beethoven. No, Duke Ellington's a genius, but Beethoven, Beethoven. That this attempt to create these analogies across national boundaries is always a very, very dangerous thing. But what is, in fact, similar about Emerson and Montaigne as we reflect on autonomy and self-construction -const is that Montaigne does create a whole new genre called the essay. That was unprecedented. He's got that wonderful chapter to philosophizers to learn how to die. And we'll get back to our conversation about learning how to die daily as opposed to dying a little death and then dying one big death. And, and the difference between that paradigm, it's a fascinating difference, an overlap, but difference as well. You see. But I mentioned the relation of Montaigne to Emerson because Emerson did invent something called the public lecture uh, that he begins, of course, as a Unitarian minister. He's in the class of 1821 here at Harvard College, and he graduates Harvard Divinity School. And he joins the second church in Boston, leaves the second church in Boston, and becomes the great public lecturer. And therefore, in reading Emerson, it's not just words on the page, but he highlights orality. He's obsessed with what the old classical thinkers call eloquence. Eloquence, and defined by Cicero and Quintilian as wisdom speaking, but it's a speak, it's speech acts. And so the translation of what he's doing 
behind the lectern, no longer the pulpit. He leaves the pulpit, but he secularizes the pulpit and creates a circuit writing network. He gives about 1,500 lectures in just a matter of decades. In fact, I was just telling Brother Roberto Fessa Unger that when he was 67 years old, he gave over 69 lectures in one year. No airplane, no first class. That's called a New England brother on the move. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a whole lot to say. But why is this important? Well, this is very important indeed because the genre that he creates is one in which he is a kind of American Socrates under the shadow of Jonathan Edwards under the shadow of the Puritan Revolution was very much about the pulpit, very much about the sermon, very much about orality, very much about a quest for wisdom, which is very, very different than what we saw briefly last week in academic moral philosophy. Going back to our distinction between philosophy as a way of life versus philosophy as an academic discourse. Ethics raising the issue, what is a good life? as opposed to what kind of methodological formulations can we come up that would ground the justifications of our choices, usually individual choices, as autonomous agents. So Emerson's going to problematize a lot of what we have to say about autonomy. Why? Because very much like what I suspect is at work in this essay, I have great respect for my dear brother Kelly, but my hunch is coming out of Harvard Divinity, uh, philosophy department, He's going to begin with Immanuel Kant. Highly predictable. There's nothing wrong beginning with Kant. The question is where you end up. But if you begin with Emerson, you're beginning in time. That's the first sentence of experience, 1844. Where do we find ourselves? Where do we find ourselves? That's an existential question. You got to situate and locate yourself, not just in time, in relation to a set of traditions, in relation to some stories, some narratives, some myths, some symbols, some legends. What kind of existential orientation can you have given the disorientation we usually find ourselves? And I've jumped to that second essay precisely because it is, in some ways, the most famous Emerson essays, and in other ways, it is very un-Emersonian because it is very much about despondency and despair and darkness, and those are not the things you think of first when you think of Emerson. Emerson's associated with believing in the green light. He's associated with optimism. He's associated with the optimal mood and temperament. But in experience, it's very clear that he's dealing with the underside, what we have been talking about in this class in terms of death, dread, despair, and disappointment. And yes, it has much to do with the death of his child, of Waldo, five years old, but it's a cumulative death as well. The death of his brother Edward, the death of Charles, and the death of the one love of his life, his first wife, Ellen, who died as a teenager. Emerson used to live right here in Concord. He would walk all the way over to Roxbury to visit her coffin. And one day, he got in the coffin with her, and they had to drag him out. That's not the stereotypical Emerson people think about in terms of blue sky, sunshine. And you see this in this elegiac wrestling with grief as a result of these very concrete, brutally concrete existential realities with which he has to come to terms, and yet he's going to be trying to hold on to his conception of, or his version of autonomy, what we call self, what he calls self-reliance. And it has so much to do with the last line in experience, that second essay, second series, those last words talks about the romance, the true romance of the world, which exists to realize the transformation of genius 
into practical power. You all remember that last slide? He's talking about defeat. She's talking about being overcome. He says, no, up, fight. What is the reason why we find ourselves thrown into space and time? The reason why we find ourselves as human beings making this brief move from womb to tomb? The reason why we choose not to commit suicide this morning, but rather come to class and hear some dialogue about Ralph. What is it? It has something to do, Emerson says, with unbelievable vocation, a calling to be willing to be transformed. Echo of Romans 12, 2. I don't know if we got any folk of high biblical literacy in this class, but Romans 12, 2 says what? Anybody remember? Be ye not conformed to the ways of the world, but transformed by the strength of one's mind. This fundamental problematic of the legacy of Jerusalem. Nonconformity. He says it in, West, in, in self-reliance. Whoso would be a human being would be a nonconformist. That self-reliance is not about some narrow conception of autonomy predicated on a self that society gives you. It is the aversion of conformity. He says society itself is what? It's a conspiracy against the human status of each and every one of us. Its virtue is conformity. To be a human being is to be nonconformist over against the dominant establishmentarian ways of being in the world, what Gramsci would call the prevailing hegemony. So the Emerson is very much about transformation, transgression, subversion, usually in individualistic and personalistic ways. And we can talk about the relation of Emerson's conception of a self vis-a-vis -vis society. He's got a tremendous suspicion of society. He believes that all societies are so thoroughly corrupt and run by mediocre folk obsessed with power and ambition that for him, his calling is going to be one of trying to shake the sleepers, to use the Rose language, his beloved student. In fact, Henry David Thoreau was born, Davy Henry. When he heard Emerson lecture, he, changed his, he turned his name around because he said, I'm a different person now. The echoes of the turning of the soul in Plato's Republic that you read, that paragogy shifting, becoming tied to a new orientation and disposition toward the world. And the sleepers are who? Sleepers are not simply those who have not been awakened, but the sleepers are also those whose backs society rests, and when they fundamentally wake up, it creates a storm in the structure of the society called hyphen consciousness, a willingness to take a stand, a tightening of the spine, most importantly, the openness of taking risk. Emerson is fundamentally about taking risk, paying cost. And I think this is one of the big differences between so much of the discourse about Immanuel Kant you get in the academy, you don't get that stress, the existential stress on the cost that you have to pay and the risk that you have to take. Emerson begins with that. Now, it's true that Emerson was obsessed with genius, and we have to say something about his relation of genius to autonomy. You see that in the first page of Self-Reliance there. Speak the laden truth Believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for everybody. That is genius. Oh, Ralph, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, but continue on. What else you got to say about it? Namely, that you fall back on authority. To fall back on tradition is already to attenuate and diminish one's own sense of possibility and potential. And genius for Emerson is not a name for a person. 
It's not a noun. Genius is energy, power, activity. He actually invokes the Chinese philosopher Mencius' language of vital flowing. And what is it? Ooh, what's the right word? That's it. I appreciate that. Vast flowing vigor. Absolutely. It's dynamic. It's on the move, as it were. And it filters through bodies and souls and so forth and so on. And one of the reasons why Emerson got in such trouble when he gave the famous divinity address in, in July of 1838, right here at First Parish, right across the way, with Charles Sumner standing there now, sitting there now in the snow, right across the way. He told oh, that graduate, graduating class at divinity school, your problem is that you all have fetishized figures, so your texts are dead, your sermons are dull, and you've given up on the possibility of continued revelation. The revelations that you talk about are tied to a past, and that past has rendered you captive. And if you don't open up for new, vast flowing vigor, you see, then you're going to end up with your churches as, as sepulchers. And what happened to Ralph when he said that? It was banned for Harvard for 30 some years. That's a compliment. <laughs> Oh, what a wonderful tribute to attempt to be true to the best of Veritas and be banned for 30 years. The Harvard Divinity School faculty generates all of their writers to criticize Emerson. What is he doing? He is an embarrassment. His reputation is dead for the rest of his life. And what does he do? He jumps on the next buggy and gives another public lecture somewhere else. And he's on to the next, he goes, Colby College, and so forth and so on. You see. In retrospect, he's elevated. In his own lifetime, he's marginalized up until the last 15, 20 years of his life. It's very important to keep in mind. So that when he's talking about being nonconformist, when he talks about being in the world but not of the world, he's willing to pay a cost. And he does. Now we should also note, just on the political front, that just a few months before he published uh, Experience, which is the uh, essay second series, that he was on the stage with the great Frederick Douglass, giving a very powerful speech in favor of abolition. And that was taking a Tremendous, uh, what, put it this way. The abolitionist movement only had a few thousand in the whole country. You see? Garrison was tarred and feathered, was almost, uh, almost killed right here in Charles Street. This is William Lloyd Garrison, who was the editor of The Liberator, the leading white figure of the abolitionist movement. Frederick Douglass, of course, has a bounty on his head, dot, 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 dot. So when you talk about abolitionism, you know, this is not some kind of uh, Tea Party operation of do-gooders of people who are concerned about Negroes catching hell because they're enslaved. And then congratulated himself with moral prizes on their, and at their annual conferences. These are folk who are willing to live and die. Yeah. When Ralph Emerson then gives a speech for John Brown after John Brown is executed, he's viewed as an enemy of the state because John Brown Ended up killing some innocent folk. I think he was wrong in doing that, but he was serious in his love for black people. In fact, he loved black people more than many black people loved themselves because he was willing to die for black people. That's John Brown, white brother. <coughs> Emerson, saluting this figure. So when he talked about self-reliance, it is a reliance on a self in transformation ascending up an endless ladder. This is the wonderful language of the great Samuel Stanley Cavell, the Emersonian perfectionism. You see. So it's an, it's an alliance upward. It's not downward to the old empirical self fundamentally shaped by the mainstream values of the society. It's a reliance on a self in transformation, forever open to change, forever open to transformation, and hoping it will spill over into institutional practices 
and structural practices. Now, Emerson, very much like Montaigne, very much like, 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 like Jesus, unlike Amos and Jeremiah, Emerson was primarily preoccupied with existential and interpersonal issues. He didn't have critiques of structures and institutions in terms of analysis of the operations of power in those institutions and structures. He had a moral witness over against the evil. That's what the abolitionist movement was about. But it's one thing to have a moral witness against the evil and to have a social analysis that allows you to understand the operations of power in those institutions and structures. Emerson did not have that at all. Jesus didn't either. That's why Jesus never gave a critique of slavery. Even Jesus himself was not an abolitionist. He had slaves, part of his group, but he didn't have a critique of slavery, per se. He was concerned with existential transformation. He was concerned with a certain kind of purification. He was concerned with a genuine love, sensitivity, and compassion with neighbors. And he was concerned with bearing witness in light of a calling or a vocation. That's Emerson's tradition. That's what I mean by the shadow of Jonathan Edwards, the puritanical stamp on Emerson. You see, the existential interpersonal, not a lot of focus on structure and institution. Now, of course, I think it was last week when I said that uh, Brother Unger had a romantic sensibility, but he's read historical sociology of Marx, Weber, Durkheim, and so on. I was just, I said that in jest, even though I think I'm partly right about that. But he, he, Professor Unger always connects self and structure, always connects self and institution, or individual and institution. It's not true for Emerson. Not at all. Wasn't true for James Baldwin, who was the greatest Emersonian of the 20th century. He always begins with his own existential struggles, and then how it relates to individuals, and a moral critique of institutions, not a social analytical understanding of the operations of power of those institutions. That's what it is to engage in prophetic witness. Prophetic witness is not the same as a subtle analytical understanding of the operations of power and structures and institutions. That's where historical sociology comes into bear. And unfortunately, in much of the prophetic witnesses, especially in the American empire, but this is true in John Ruskins and Thomas Carlyle's in England and, and others in, in, in other places around the world, that historical sociology has not been given the kind of weight and gravity that it deserves. Now, what is it about Emerson's notion of beruf of calling and vocation? Well, one is that he believes that you have to democratize genius, you have to democratize calling. So when the Protestants, for example, Martin Luther came along and asked the Catholic Church to commit class suicide, so we don't need the priests anymore. We got a priesthood of all believers. Every believer is a priest. You don't say. You must come out of the Augustinian strand. Catholic tradition, yes I do, Martin Luther said. But Emerson comes along and says what? It's not just a priesthood of all believers, but following the Quakers, where every human being has a natural light inside of them, and if they're willing to open themselves and cultivate themselves, that light would shine and manifest in their witness, their deeds, their actions, their fruits, not just their discourse, not just their words, but their lives, the courageous, risk-ridden lives. Emerson's very close to the Quakers in that regard. It's the left wing of the Reformation, in which it's not just priesthood of all believers of a Martin Luther, but every human being has a spark, has a godlike quality inside of them. And for Emerson, the genius that's represented inside of each and every one of us is that which can never be subsumed, that can never be fully tamed. It's the excess, the surplus that's inside of each and every one of us that can spill over if we have the courage to allow it to spill over. Now, will get us in a lot of trouble because that spillover means radical nonconformity. It means to be targeted. It means to be over against the grain and so forth. 
But for Emerson, following the Quakers on the left side of the Reformation, his conception is a democratized conception of vocation, a democratized conception of genius in which there's a power inside of every human being to, in fact, have their own calling to ascend to levels of excellence, what the Greeks call arate, and every human being has that, not just capacity, but for Emerson, he believes that is the most intense way of being human. That's what it means to take seriously that fundamental claim of Hebrew scripture, is to choose life, choose life to be most intensely alive in following through on one's own calling or vocation in one's quest for excellence relative to the gifts that one has. And Emerson's own calling was understood in terms of eloquence, in terms of awakening his fellow citizens, awakening his human beings by oral lecture, by text, and then spilling over at times in deeds. Now, Emerson did write a text that's called The Conduct of Life, 1860. I don't know whether Brother Roberto, were you consciously choosing this because of Ralph? Well, not. Not really. It's just serendipity. No, I'm just kidding. That, uh, uh, but it's interesting because for Emerson, once talk about conduct of life becomes highly professionalized, working through methods, preoccupation with procedures, protocol, you lose precisely what we talked about last week. Dynamic context, radical contingency, brutal concrete facts one, in one's own life as well as in the life that we share together. And most importantly, it holds at arm's length what we started this class with, which is the catastrophic. And we try to domesticate the catastrophic into the problematic. Yeah. And so I hope it, in reading these two essays, and I hope you get a chance to read much more Emerson. Emerson was, was overlooked for a long time uh, when Stanley Cavell finally tried to bring him back in philosophy departments. He was laughed at. I was blessed to be the uh, teaching assistant, Stanley Cavell and Martha Nussbaum, in 1975 in Humanities V here at Harvard. And Stanley Cavell used to get laughed at by talking about Ralph Emerson as a serious thinker. Ralph, every people were saying, no, he, he, he belongs in self-help sections of the bookstore. Self-reliance is for that good American spirit of ingenuity and always bouncing back against the feet that fitting into American society and being highly successful, becoming the smartest and the richest because that's your potential. That's the opposite of Emerson. And yet that's a dominant orientation in terms of perceiving Emerson. And of course, Emerson's rich enough that he can be appropriated by a whole host of folks. Because I mean, he's very you know, popular at the business school. Well, that's subject matter for another lecture, isn't it? <laughs> he's, he's popular at the law school in terms of the spiritual side, once you get all that technical stuff out of you. Oh, no, Ralph Emerson is part of a long, rich, humanistic tradition that flows out of the legacies of Athens, Jerusalem, and other places in conversation with the best of the East. There's no Emerson without his conversations with the poets. From, Persia and China and other places, but it's over against. So his notion of autonomy is always accenting critique, resistance, internal transformation, not enough talk about social transformation, but we'll get to that. Well, let me stop now and open it up for questions and queries before. Brother, yes, jump in. Real 
what is the end goal if the emphasis is of a constant renewal? So I've always sort of, how, did, how does somebody manage the cognitive dissonance that arises between the reality and some sort of mental image of what is ideal? Well, to be able to live within the tensions, but to try to make those tensions creative rather than destructive. And you always run the risk of being captive to the destructive tensions, but there's no way to eliminate the tensions. And so you, you have to choose between whether you're going to be able to sustain being in the storm, in the tensions, and generating courage, creativity, compassion, a quest for that which is new and novel. Not because the new and novel is simply new and novel but because it organically grows out of one's own struggles in terms of trying to be a mature human being. So yes, that cognitive dissonance is very, very real. You see it in the last paragraph of experience, right? The tremendous gap between the world you live in and the world you imagine and the inability to, able to, to ever fully grasp the real. And every attempt to grasp the real is partly a construction on our behalf as it relates to something external to us. And that's a gap that is unovercomable, and therefore it's endless, it's incomplete, it's open-ended, and the struggle, the conversation, the dialogue, the attempt to make the world itself better goes on and on and on. There is no final, static, stationary telos or end and aim in Emerson. <laughs> Oh, the joy's in the struggle in part, though. Oh, yeah. But, but you are making some progress. It's not as if it's a repetition of the same, though. But what, what, other, what other kind of joy would you like, you think? <laughs> you looking for some other kind of joy, too? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, you know that. Go right ahead, though, brother. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. So in a way, I'm thinking, OK, he's creating something different. He's courageous to stand up against the Pope. So he still had that demon. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, no, indeed. Oh, no, you see, again, I mean, as you know, all of these figures, we had to keep track of their creative breakthroughs and keep track of their gangster activity. <laughs> now, uh, uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, Martin Luther was significant because of the courage he had to stand up against the Holy Catholic Empire. Here I stand, I can do no other. And then call for that class suicide that I talked about. Now that was very important in terms of not just democratizing tendencies, but also in terms of the way in which religion in the West would understand itself. Then there are revolts against Luther, and it goes on and on. But anti-Jewish hatred that goes all the way back to the very beginnings of Christianity, you see. We didn't have to wait till Martin Luther. They had to wait to 1519 to get vicious anti-Jewish hatred. But he builds on that anti-Jewish hatred. It's not something that he just decides because Jews do not join. It's something that's part and parcel of the history of Christianity going all the way back at the, to the beginning. And we do have to acknowledge that, too. Oh, absolutely. But we could talk about his suppression of the, of the peasant rebellion. We could talk about it a whole host of things that having to do with evils, the white supremacy, the male supremacy, the misogyny, all of that built in to Luther. If we're gonna tell a whole story about who Martin Luther was, I was just accenting the Protestant Reformation as having a tremendous impact on Emerson. And you can't say anything about the Protestant Reformation without saying something about Brother Martin. L Luther, not Martin Luther King, Luther, you see. Uh, uh, so you're, you're right to acknowledge these undersides of any of these figures. Oh, very much so. You had an, another question, though? Was it two? Oh, that was it. Yes. Yes, my dear sister. You better speak louder so they can hear behind you. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's, that's a very important distinction because if, in fact, one believes traditions are unavoidable and inescapable, then the question is which aspects of tradition are worthy of being recovered, and which aspects should be rejected. Now, we have to keep in mind that any time we, we engage in any discourse about the East or the West, African or indigenous, I mean, we, we, we don't want any homogenizing of this. We understand all the variety because as, as we know, within the West itself, there's long, rich traditions of escaping from the self and surrendering to powers that are bigger than oneself. One can actually read Emerson's notion of the oversoul as an attempt to get a self that is surrendering to something bigger than itself but it's that simultaneously it's becoming a better self as it surrenders. So that self is still there, but it's not a valorizing of the self, a deifying of the self. Now there is a tradition of deifying of the self in the West. And I think you're right to point that out because that has a tremendous prominence and we have, to, we have to come to terms with that. But you've got access to traditions within the West that are highly critical of that other Western tradition. When we talk about the West, you get all these different traditions. But back to your crucial point, which is, uh, oh, the, what is the relation between the self and tradition? Is that, is that a fair way of, 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 of characterizing what you were getting at? Yeah, or, or higher power, higher authority in that way. Uh, and we're going to be wrestling with that, uh, that profound question throughout this class. I think what I, what, what I find insightful about Emerson is that he tries to convince us, <coughs> bless you, that we should always have a hermeneutics of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis traditions, even though whatever hermeneutics of suspicion we have will itself be part of a tradition. So it's not as if we're escaping tradition by being critical of tradition. There's no such thing as a tradition of the new that creates itself out of nothing. Or Whitehead puts it so, when he, Whitehead puts it well in the Adventures of Ideas when he says, uh, uh, every novelty is not wholly new. Now in America, that means cut against the grain, because America's all about newness, newness, newness. Now in America, the market picks up on that. Oh, we got something new for you. Where's your money? Here's a commercial. <laughs> this is going to make you feel like Prometheus. This, here's some money. See what I mean? I think during the Super Bowl, they had an uh, advertisement, you know, invoking, uh, well, we won't go into we on tape here now. <laughs> but, uh, but it burned me up. But I mean, you know, the market valorizes a certain conception of newness and novelty. That's not what Emerson's talking about. He's talking about a newness and novelty that has to do with existential wrestling, a ways in which we're trying to become more loving, more critical, more compassionate, more self-critical. Uh, uh, does, that, does that begin to get at, to get at your question? Just, just a little bit. No, indeed. Yes, qu question. Now again, we understand self-reliance as a species of nonconformity, right? So how do we go about being nonconformist relative to material resources available to us, relative to our material re circumstances under which we find ourselves, um, and the kind of choices we make, the kind of commitments we make, uh, re will reflect the quality of the wrestling with that question. But there's no way of denying the impact of antecedent circumstances on any of our self-making. 
You see the point I'm making? That is to say, you have, we're all born in circumstances not of our own choosing. Biologically, DNA, genes and so forth. Mom and dad, various cultural traditions, religious traditions and so on. And we all have a certain conformity to those. There's affection, a whole lot of things go into that. And Emerson is saying that even given that, we should have a vocation, a calling, to be nonconformist vis-a-vis those things if we are to become the kind of mature human beings that we all can become. Now, you can imagine, I mean, people could say, well, you know, I, I kind of like my conformity, and my parents were fantastic and good friends, and having a good time at Harvard, and that, that, well, why I got to be so nonconformist about this, Mr. Emerson? And you say, oh, you just keep doing what you're doing and see when you, when you flatten out, when you hit up against the dead end, you see. Because it's in the fruit. It's not gonna be a question of some a priori formulations prior to your experience. Just keep living, keep undergoing whatever sufferings, doings, and so forth, and then in retrospect say, did I miss out on something? A joy, did I miss out on a love of a truth or a goodness or a beauty and so forth and so on. So that's the ways in which a conversation takes place between, let's say, a critic of, of Emerson who would say, look, uh, uh, the, these material circumstances are such that I can conform, or if I have radically inadequate material circumstances, then I'm already a nonconformist to the degree to which I'm trying to create a, a situation in which I can eat and live and be able to proceed with dignity. So you might have a certain tilt toward nonconformity. So I understand, Cornell, that an aspect of the question mm -hmm. is uh, that it can be a project for society, a political project, mm. to help form individuals who are resistant to it. So this seems to be paradoxical, but it's a, it's mm. a central mm. theme mm -hmm. in, in our idea of democracy and in the relation mm. of democracy yeah. to this conception of the diffusion of prophetic powers in the whole of humanity. So it's not just a project for the individual. It's a project for society to make it more possible to form such individuals. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this, as this yeah. may seem superficially paradoxical, but it's central to our, to our ideas about democracy and about the individual. You know, we, I should just note as two footnotes that uh, John Dewey is not known for being a great prose writer, even though he was a great philosopher. That's always a challenge. But his essay on Emerson as philosopher of democracy that he wrote in 1903, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Emerson's birth, is one of the most beautiful, poetic reflections one would ever get of one American philosopher on another. Uh, it's called Emerson, Philosopher of Democracy. P people couldn't believe that John Dewey had written this thing. It's like, wow, he really got hit by genius and power and unbelievable uh, poetic uh, sensibility. And after the next essay, it was right back to Dewey's old wooden prose. But, uh, um, but that essay was unbelievable. And William James also, Harvard's own William James, wrote a 1903 salute to Emerson, which was magnificent, but William James's writing tend to be magnificent across the board, so people weren't surprised. But both of those conceptions of Emerson had to do with this paradoxical relation between self-creation on the one hand and a society that is perennial attempting to create itself as it explores by means of self-criticism, by means of ensuring that everyday people have a have a, have, have a voice in shaping their, their destiny. Emerson used to say, the mark of wisdom is to find the miraculous in the common and the extraordinary in the ordinary. And that's precisely this deep democratic sensibility that everyday people 
have a certain dignity and sanctity and that their voices ought to be heard in shaping the kind of society and destiny that they, that they move toward. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And make sure we can all hear your voice, my brother. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And what would be a, what would be an example? You think, though, brother? What, what, which E.G. do you have in mind? Alt right calling for transformation. Sure. Yeah, but the alt-right tends to be tied to a defense of very tight static hierarchies, racial hierarchy, sexual hierarchy, sexual orientation, or class hierarchy, imperial hierarchies. See, so that the kinds of transformations Emerson is after tend to be ones that are highly suspicious of hierarchies across the board, which is a democratic sensibility, right? The democratic sensibility is whatever hierarchy you end up with, those at the top must be accountable to those at the bottom. Because hierarchies are going to be inevitable and inescapable. But what kind of mechanisms of accountability do you have in place? And we understand the alt right to say, this is not about democracy. This is not about accountability. We know naturally that these men ought to be ruling women. White folk ought to be ruling these black folk, red folk, yellow folk, and so the straights ought to be ruling. the gays and lesbians and trans. You see what I mean? So in that sense, it's not any form of transformation. Highly what? Non-conforming? You know, based on journalistic reportage, yeah. I mean, based on journalistic reportage, they're the only radicals in America. I said, dang, I've been trying to be radical all my life. I miss out. (laughs) Because the language that is used by the mainstream tends to evacuate and empty out the kinds of notions of Emersonian nonconformity, what radicalism has historically meant, getting at the root of things and having a critique in forms of resistance that target that root, you see. Those tend to be pushed out and you end up with the radical, the nonconformists, and so forth and so on, you see. But, you're, but I think both of you all are right, though, that the ways in which these, these terms, this language, the terminology is so easily deployed to, uh, in, in, for you know, their own ends and aims. Yes, question. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I think you're absolutely right if, and you tell me whether you agree with me or not, if we understand genius in this democratized way. Usually genius is associated with a romantic ideology that has to do with one grand ego that exfoliates itself in a highly creative way and others must defer because of the level of their unbelievable creativity. That's right, and that, that's, the, that's the romantic. That's the romantic. Now, I mean, the Russians have a rich, oh my God, the dear Russian brother here. Uh, the Russians have a conception of genius and geniality, which is largeness of heart, largeness of mind, largeness of courage that then is manifest. And it's not isolated individualistic, but it does allow us to keep track of the difference between a Dostoevsky as opposed to you know, some short story writer 
at the uh, Atlantic Monthly. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there are differences. It's the largeness of, of a whole lot of things going on in that way, you see. So w w would you accept that formulation? Yeah. Because Absolutely, absolutely. Question. Uh, yeah. Emerson talks about in the experience about how we're only able to um, speak to as what we are, right? That, that anything that we speak comes to us what we are first. But um, continually changing, though. Yes. Yes, and that's that, right. And, and self reliance, um, he talks about this listening to our personal genius. But how, how is that genius not a part of what he, what he starts by saying? But we're always agents for, for Emerson. We're always subjects in motion, involved in activity, and therefore we're never simply either victims or never simply recipients. We are receiving much, of course. We're being bombarded with a whole host of things. But we're continually contesting, thinking, resisting, critiquing, suffering, and so forth. Uh, uh, so in that sense, what I meant by that, that who we are is always understood in a dynamic manner, in a dynamic way, you see. Uh, but it's going to be so very, very different. This is one of the reasons why uh, Nietzsche fell in love with Emerson. And he liberated Nietzsche, you know, and Nietzsche in high school. When he first read Emerson, the first three essays Nietzsche ever wrote in his life were on moods, temperament, based on his reading of truncated translations of Emerson in German. And he would say that for the rest of his life. People said, how could Nietzsche love Emerson? Oh, read about it. What a profound love affair. But it, very similar, self-fashioning, self-creation. But Nietzsche much more rooted with not just the Greeks, but with Homer and Achilles and Thucydides, whereas Emerson is much more Socrates and then on to Jerusalem with Hebrew scripture and Jesus and, and so on. But you can see the overlap, who we are always, something to be overcome, a strong will to be overcome, something stronger than our will, pushing us, inspiration, sparks, some powers behind us and so on. Uh, but it's going to be highly singular. See, one of the differences between talking about autonomy and the Kantian mode is what? Khan is obsessed with two things all the time. Universality, necessity. So what is generated holds for everybody equally. Right? That's what it is to be rational. Rationality and autonomy are tied to finding what is necessary, finding what is universal. Whereas for Emerson and Nietzsche, it's singular, unique, distinctive, your struggle, your existential wrestling, different than somebody else's, your calling, not always the same. That the common denominator is the quest for excellence, but it's very, very different relative to the gifts that, that we have relative to who we are, relative to the choices we make in cultivating whatever gifts that we have. So it's much more existential, much more tied to this mess that we were talking about last, last week in terms of our own individual lives, how we conduct, conduct our lives. I know it's getting late, though. We got to let Brother Robert. One last question for this dear sister here. Yes. Um, to be a bit provocative here, I think you are disagreeing with what Professor Unger um, was saying about how they're kind of closely connected. Um, and I think your argument was that there's, it's not so straightforward of a relationship between self-transformation and social transformation. So I was just hoping maybe you could speak a little more to that. Well, I appreciate that question. That is an ideal question to segue into Brother Roberto's presentation. Uh, I don't want anybody to think that we had a dialogue this week so we could set this up because you asked that on your own, and that's a powerful question. I do think that there's strong overlap between Professor Hunger and myself. We think both of them are very, very important. Uh, I think when I was accusing him of a certain kind of romantic sensibility, and he was bouncing back strong as well, well, let me, let me be clear about this. That's a heresy, that's a heresy, let's be clear. 
that, uh, and, and that's, that's fun. That's what this classing part is all about, showing the differences, so I appreciate that. But uh, no, well, we both recognize just how important both of those are, but they're related in very, very complicated ways, very complex ways. And in the end, because we all have one life to live, that one must never put a premium on structural transformation that downplays the challenges of the existential, the personal, the individual, uh, in light of what Professor Unger calls biographical time and historical time. But, but we, we're going to get into your very, very crucial question here. But I know Brother Roberto's going to say a lot about personal and structural transformation. Is that right? Yes. So why? Yes. So this is, this is a good point for me to, for me to intervene. Uh, let me begin by saying something about the perspective from which I make these remarks. Uh, in an effort to explain our project here in the course, yeah. Yeah. or at least the project from my point of view, and. To that end, uh, I want to go back to remarks I made in our first class. Uh, for the last 200 or 300 years, uh, the world has been on fire. There has been a revolution. There is a revolutionary agenda in the world that has aroused the whole of humanity. And, and, and this agenda has two faces a political face and a personalist face. Mm. The political mm. face is brought by the, the doctrines of democracy, of liberalism, and of socialism. And the personalist face is carried by the worldwide romantic culture, especially the global popular romantic culture, with its message of the divinity of the ordinary man and woman. This remains, as it has been for a long time, the most powerful agenda in the world. It is far from being the only agenda, and it has many enemies in the world. But it remains in command, because all the other projects in the world respond to it. So in that sense, it is the most powerful. But in another sense, it is now weak. Mm. It is weak because its adepts no longer know what its next step should be. Uh, they are confused. And insofar as there is no imagination of the next steps, it is immeasurably weakened. So from my standpoint, the program here of the course is to examine this situation primarily on the moral side rather than on the political side. But of course, they're, they're connected. So we're not just engaging a series of thinkers and positions with an interest in the history of ideas. We have a stake, the stake mm -hmm. that I just mm -hmm. described, of exploring the next steps mm -hmm. and trying to discover the possible architecture of the moral ideas, the ideas about the conduct of life that we need. Mm -hmm. In that respect, we find that there are two tangible visions of the conduct of life in this revolutionary or post-revolutionary situation uh, that continue to have immense authority but seem to be radically incomplete or defective for the purpose that I just described. One of them is the image of Christian charity, which, as it is traditionally expounded, uh, appears to be a form of universal altruism, although it shouldn't be to remain close mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. right. essential spirit of Christianity. The other is the image of a romantic questing, of romantic adventure, as we have it in the literature of romanticism. These are very two tangible pictures of how to live. And both of them seem not to be enough, not to answer this question that I just posed, 
of what the next step should be. That's the perspective from which, from which I'm speaking. In this search, we do begin with a certain idea of humanity or of the self that has immense power in this revolutionary tradition. Let's call it the idea of the embodied spirit. So shorn of its theological or metaphysical framework, the idea is this. We are formed in particular contexts, in particular social and conceptual worlds. They make us who we are. We're always situated. Nevertheless, there is always more in us, in each of us individually, and in all of us collectively, the human race, than there is or ever can be in them. We transcend them. There is in us an element of surplus, of excess. We spill over them. They are unable to contain us. And it is this feature of the spilling over of the excess that we call spirit. Mm -hmm. But spirit is embodied. That's the background idea of the self of humanity. And this moral architecture that we're, our, that we're in search of has to remain somehow in communion with that idea to, mm -hmm. to refine it, to develop it. Uh, so that the idea can inform the moral project. And now in that spirit, I, I, I make four sets of remarks very briefly so that we can have some time for, for discussion. Mm. Uh, first, about the conception of the ideal of autonomy. Second, about the political construction of autonomy. Mm. Autonomy is a collective project for society in politics, translated into institutional innovations. Third, autonomy as a personal project, a project for the individual who cannot choose his moment in history. He awakes and he finds himself at some arbitrary position in this progression to a different social order. And somehow, the way he lives has to make up for the defects of politics. And then the fourth set of remarks is just an outline of a conception of the virtues as one of the ways of describing this missing moral architecture. So that's the program. And what I can say is, uh, in each of these steps is, is only suggestive, a, a first step. So first, the conception of autonomy with respect to its goal or ideal and with respect to its method or its practice. In regard to each, the goal and the method, there is a narrower conception and a broader conception. Uh, if we take any particular thinker like Emerson, mm, mm. Uh, it's not clear where he stands in this spectrum between mm. the narrow and the broad. Uh, there's much in the writing that suggests it's the narrower conception, but then there's the groping to the broader. The narrower and defective conception of the ideal of autonomy is associated with what we could call Prometheanism. So it's the idea that uh, in this flawed world and this defective social order, the individual builds himself. He saves himself. Like uh, the little Napoleon, he crowns himself. And uh, this is the overt a program of Prometheanism. And you can say it's defective because it's a lie about the character of self-construction. We're not these little Napoleons. And 
uh, all self-construction requires the others mm -hmm. and has to do with this ambivalence, this inescapable ambivalence that we have to the others because we need them and they threaten us. So how can we connect to them without losing ourselves? We must connect to them, otherwise we have no self. But every connection is dangerous. So the broader conception of the goal is the one that rejects this Prometheanism, the goal of the ideal of autonomy. And it says the goal is to establish both in personal life and in social life, both through moral action and through politics, a way of connecting to the others that allows us to connect more without paying the price of subjugation or depersonalization, or at least paying less of the price. Now, I describe the overt objective of Prometheanism, which is this self-crowning. But Prometheanism also seems to have a hidden goal. The hidden goal is to defeat death, or more generally, to defeat or deny what I described as those irreparable flaws in the human condition, our mortality, our insatiability, our groundlessness, as well as our susceptibility to belittlement. So Prometheanism is, in this sense, a kind of beating of the drums in the presence of death, a celebration of power or a construction of power denying our fragility and mortality. And in that respect as well, a dangerous form of self-deception. It is this confrontation with the irreparable flaws of the human condition that allows us to awake from the slumber of conformity, as Emerson mm. describes it, mm -hmm. and gives to human life its characteristic shape. Uh, now comes the question of the method or the practice. And once again, we can distinguish a narrower conception from a broader conception. The narrower conception you might call romanticism, or it's an aspect mm. of romanticism. Mm. Mm. It's this idea to which I referred last week, that the moment of true feeling or true life, the authentic human moment, is the moment when we shake the structures or the routines. Mm. And then we live. We live more completely. The structures will always come back. So these are only interludes of true life. Mm. Because what we cannot do, according to this romantic conception, is fundamentally alter the relation of life or spirit to structure and routine. We can shake it, but we can't change this antagonism of structure to spirit. And this is why I claimed last week that uh, romanticism expresses a deficiency of hope, a lack of hope in the possibility of changing this relation between spirit and structure. So that's romantic love rather than a, a, a persistent relation, a marriage, uh, the mob in the streets rather than the routines of administrative life and so forth. The alternative conception of the method is that autonomy cannot be developed simply by disruption. Disruption mm -hmm. is not a complete formula for the promotion of autonomy. There has to be a change in the nature of the institutions, of the practices, of the habitual predispositions that we call the virtues, a change in the relation between the formulaic and the anti-formulaic elements. It can't be just that interlude of disruption. Uh, now, let me go on to the second step of the remarks, which is then consider from the broader standpoint, broader with respect to the goal and broader with respect to the method, autonomy as a political project. 
and then we'll consider it as a personal project. So uh, what is the general direction? What are some of the features of the direction by which we build a society that is capable of forming and sustaining these more autonomous individuals, individuals who have an enhanced power of agency, who can turn the tables on their circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to give you a, a, an open-ended list of some of the features of such a direction, given our present historical situation. So first, the individual should have a, a stake, a, a set of protected vital interests, immunities, and safeguards that allow him to stand up to be like the Seraph Abdiel in, in Paradise Lost, unshaken, unsubdued, unterrified, so that he can continue to thrive and to act in the midst of all of the surrounding conflict and innovation, so that his sense of security and of agency not depend on the rigidification of the surrounding social space. Mm. Now, there are many practical forms of that that are conventional in contemporary political debates. Uh, one of the most common is the idea of a minimum guaranteed income. But a deeper one would be the idea of a social inheritance, a package of resources, a stake that the individual has from the state uh, and that gives him a, a, a minimum on which he can draw mm -hmm. at turning points in his life. Now, a second element is the character of education. So the object of education should be to recognize in the child a tongue-tied prophet. The school in a democracy under this conception is not the instrument of the, of the family or of the state. The school is the voice of the future. And the focus of education is the development of certain capabilities of analysis and of synthesis. The thematic content should prefer selective deepening to encyclopedic superficiality. The social setting of education should be cooperative rather than a combination of individualism and authoritarianism. Mm. And above all, education should be dialectical. Every subject should be taught from at least two contrasting points of view. You know, the orthodoxies of the university culture are based on the forced marriage of method to subject matter, as if a given subject matter had a natural and necessary method. Mm -hmm. uh, and the national curriculums that exist in the world are a kind of infantilization of these orthodoxies of the university culture. They project back these orthodoxies and uh, emasculate young people, delivering them to the higher stages of education prepared for a life of intellectual servility. Uh, so what we should desire is that education, uh, and especially basic education, should be deeper than the current university education. Mm -hmm. It should uh, immunize the young against this intellectual servitude, uh, delivering them to the higher stages of uh, education already safeguarded against this surrender. Uh, so that's another aspect of the formation of the power of agency. It's political. It's collective. Huh? Uh, now then, third, we more broadly, we have to imagine the institutional reconstruction of both democratic politics and the market economy. So we would want, then, that this strengthening of the individual have as its counterpart the throwing open of society to radical and continuing experimentation. Mm -hmm. And that has a political side and an economic side. So democracy is not just 
the rule of the majority qualified by the rights of minorities. Democracy is the collective creation of the new. And uh, we want to overthrow the rule of the living by the dead and to diminish the dependence of change on crisis so that we can have change without crisis being the indispensable enabling condition of transformation. Mm -hmm. So we want a high energy democracy through political arrangements that elevate the level of popular engagement in political life through access to the means of mass, mass communication or public financing of political activity. We want constitutional arrangements that resolve impasse quickly, accelerating politics rather than deliberately slowing it down through, for example, early elections or comprehensive programmatic plebiscites. And we want to combine the power of decisive central initiative with the ability of particular parts of the society to deviate mm. from the general solutions mm. and create counter models of the national future. Then we heat politics up and we render the structure vulnerable. Now, what do we want in the economy? We want the market economy not to be fastened to a single version of itself. So that eventually alternative mm. regimes of economic decentralization, that is a property and contract, can coexist experimentally in the same economic order. Mm. Mm. And we want these institutional arrangements to facilitate the wide diffusion in society of the forms of production that are closest to the imagination. Now the knowledge intensive advanced practice of production, rather than allowing this advanced practice of production to remain confined to insular vanguards uh, from which the vast majority of firms and workers are, are excluded. And in the future, as this transformed economic order develops, we want to change the relation between people and machines, as I suggested the mm. other day. Mm. No one should be condemned to do the work that can be done by a machine. Our time should be exclusively for what we have not yet learned how to repeat. That's the proper economic situation for an embodied spirit. The machine does the repeatable. And as the legal basis, for this economic alternative. We want the higher forms of free work to prevail over the lower form. The lower form is economically dependent wage labor. The higher forms are self-employment and cooperation. Now, of course, each of these elements on this list is just the beginning of a, a long set of disputes, of problems of institutional design. But the list gives you a sense of the direction of what it would mean to say that the construction of autonomy is a political project. Uh, it is a political project that presupposes or is related to a certain conception of the mind. So on this conception, the mind has two sides. On one side, the mind is like a machine. It is modular and formulaic. But on the other side, the mind is an anti-machine. It is not modular. It is not formulaic. It can combine everything with everything else. That's the attribute that we call recursive infinity. And above all, it is capable of transgressing its own presuppositions and casting aside its own methods of seeing something or discovering something, and then after the fact, making sense of what it has discovered. That's what we call the imagination, the second side of the mind. Now, the relative power of these two sides of the mind, the mind as a machine and the mind as anti-machine, is not determined by the physical constitution of the brain. It is determined by the organization of society and of culture. And in that sense, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. So this is, this is one way of explaining what I'm describing as the political project of autonomy. Now I come then to the third step of my remarks, which is then autonomy as the personal project. 
we don't live in historical time. Mm. The historical time in which such a collective project advances or fails to advance. We live in biographical time. And we don't get to choose the moment in history in which our lifetimes fall. So our lifetimes happen to have fallen in a counter-revolutionary interlude mm. in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. Uh, and I'm speaking throughout this course as one who refuses to surrender to the assumptions <laughs> and attitudes that are characteristic of the counter-revolutionary interlude. Uh, so uh, given that, this, that a project like the one that I just outlined has not advanced very far, mm. we have to ask, what, what do we do? How do we live? How do we live so that to some extent our way of living can make up for the failures of politics? Mm. So there's this special relation between the political form of the project and the personal form of the project. The institutional innovations would economize on virtue. Their absence makes virtue understood as the conception of a certain way of living all the more important. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what then are the characteristics of this way of living? that would go beyond the image of Christian charity or the romantic idea of the questing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there are, again, two sides, because we have two confrontations with structure. Structure as it is manifest in society, and structure as it is expressed within ourselves in the form of the rigidified form of the self, which is our character, the mass, the mummy, as I called it. And to be autonomous, mm. Mm. we have to confront structure in both these senses. Now, there's something common uh, to these two, two efforts. Uh, to confront structure in both these senses, we have to accept a heightened vulnerability. We need to face those irreparable flaws in human existence, not to deny them. We need them because they awaken us and keep us awake. Uh, but then, as well, uh, we need to pay this price of a higher vulnerability. We can't wage war against the element of routine or repetition in life because, as Kierkegaard mm. said, I mentioned the other day, the war against repetition is a war against life. But what we do want is to change the relation between the element of repetition and of non-repetition in our experience. So what does that mean? First of all, with respect to our attitude to the flawed social order in which we find ourselves. In general, it means that we have to seek always to be both insiders and outsiders. That is to say, we participate in a world, the world that exists. We take a position within it, but we don't give it the last word. We keep the last word for ourselves. And we act in this world as if we were not completely its puppets. We, we speak from within it and from outside it. And that has implications, for example, for the way we perform roles. So from the academic metaethics, you would never guess what most of practical morality is actually about. It's not about those universal rules that the professors of philosophy uh, discourse on. Uh, uh, the preponderant element in practical morality is the ethic of roles. You occupy certain roles vis-a-vis -vis other people, parent in relation to child, employer to employee, uh, physician to patient, uh, and so forth. And 
these roles have built into them an ethic, a set of, ex of reciprocal expectations. That's what most of practical morality is about. Uh, now, of course, the system of roles that exists in the social order is designed for the reproduction of the social order, mm -hmm. not for its transformation. And the, the consequence, speaking from this point of view, is that we can't entirely repudiate or disregard this ethic of roles, mm. uh, but we can't give into it. We can't take it as the sole element. So to act in this spirit of being insiders and outsiders at the same time, we have to use the roles incongruously. So we perform a role, but we don't perform it completely as it was designed to be performed. Because otherwise, we would just be reproducing the existing arrangements. We have to stretch the roles. We have to have what Jean-Paul Sartre called bad faith in the performance of the roles. Uh, we have to be ambivalent about the roles and about the ethic of the roles. And this produces a whole set of moral complications which it is much better to face mm -hmm. than to deny or disregard. Mm -hmm. Now comes the other side, which is the, the confrontation with structure as it exists in the form of the rigidified self, the character. So we grow older, this carapace of routine begins to form around us one of Emerson's main objects in these essays. Uh, and it's a combination of this rigidified form of the self with our habitual circumstance in society, the role, the position that we've assumed. And then in this carapace, in this shell, in this mummy, we begin to die, to die by installments, mm. these many small deaths. So we have the problem of breaking out of the mummy. Now, we can't just will ourselves to break out of the mummy. Uh, an act of will is insufficient. But the will mm. has a powerful, albeit indirect, function mm. in this task. We can will ourselves to be in situations in which we are not in control or less in control. And the chances of the breaking out of the chance to break out of the mummy becomes greater. And one of the methods that we have for that is to try and relate our existence to the largest possible aims to which we can be in significant relation. So one of the most common mistakes that people make is that they devote their lives to goals that are too small. And to have any prospect of facing this rigidified character you have to devote your, your, your existence, your activity, to aims that are large. They may not be large by the standards of the world, of power and influence. But they're large for you. The largest to, wi in, to which you can have this, this meaningful connection, uh, which helps you then destabilize, destroy the mummy. So then you, you live. Now I come to the last set of my remarks. Um, there are many ways in which this conception of the conduct of life, this attempt to think what's the next stage of the revolutionary project on its moral side rather than primarily on its political side, although the two are connected, uh, could be uh, expounded. There's not one vocabulary. Mm. But one very traditional vocabulary is the vocabulary of the virtues. Now, what are the virtues? The virtues are these habitual predispositions to action. And once again, we face the problem of relating the repetitious to the non-repetitious. And you can imagine, then, 
a doctrine of the virtues, which would be one of the many ways of expressing or developing the moral program uh, that I just suggested. So first there are the virtues which are the pagan virtues, as they were initially conceived. Uh, the virtues of connection or interdependence. These were almost the entire object of the ancient moral philosophy. And is what is referred to when we use this label virtue ethics. But we would have to reinterpret each of them. So one of these virtues of connection or interdependence is respect. But what does respect mean in this conception? Respect means the acknowledgment of the other as embodied spirit, as a context transcending agent. Uh, forbearance means acting in a way that gives space to the other to develop in the same direction of the enhancement of agency, to diminish the price that connection exacts by way of subjugation or depersonalization. And fairness. Uh, fairness means that. Fairness means treating other people in such a way that they won't have to be subjugated or depersonalized in order to be connected to us. And then there's a fourth pagan virtue, courage. Courage in this conception is willingness to pay the price mm -hmm. of the heightened vulnerability. That's courage true. is the enabling virtue. That's right. It's not the highest virtue, but it's the virtue in the absence of which all the other virtues are rendered sterile. Now then you can imagine a second level of the virtues. These are the virtues of purification of kenosis, to use mm -hmm. the vocabulary of mm -hmm. patristic theology, the, the emptying out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we separate ourselves from everything that denies our character as embodied spirit or, or seduces us into endeavors of false transcendence. So what are these virtues of purification? Simplicity. We distinguish the central from the peripheral. We refuse to be absorbed in, in, in the activities that are unworthy of us. Enthusiasm. We deliver ourselves above all to those forms of experience in which we feel ourselves to be ourselves. We, mm -hmm. we experience this transcendence in such a way that it is as if time stops. And attentiveness. Uh, we liberate ourselves from the control of the mind by a rigid categorical scheme so that we can see more of the manifest world around us. The ideal is the ideal to be a mind on which nothing is lost. Then we come to the highest virtues, which are the virtues of divinization. These are the forms of action by which we increase our share in the qualities that we ascribe to the divine. Not the qualities of omniscience and omnipotence, but the quality of transcendence. And these virtues are two. Openness to the new or to the future and openness to the other person. And they are very intimately connected. To live for the future is a certain way of living in the present as a being not totally determined by the present conditions of his existence. So in the end, all we have is the present moment. We only live in the present. That's all we ever have. 
now, this moment. But the openness to the future is a way of transforming our experience of living in the present mm -hmm. so that we possess it. Because we don't confuse the present experience with the established structure. And this openness to the, to the new or to the future is related to the openness to the other. Because no one saves himself, contrary to what Prometheanism supposes. Uh, and it's through our engagement with the others that we are driven forward. So there's the theme of connection or love, which is the openness to the other. And there's the theme of infinity, which is the openness to the future, to the new. What is the relation between them? They're related in many different ways. One of the ways in which they're related is this, that it is in these experiences of connection that we are able to recognize one another as who we really are these context transcending agents. But the problem is that we are not yet these agents. We have to make ourselves into them through these political and personal projects. Well, uh, this is just mm. a suggestion, because as I said at the outset, the whole aim then is to engage these particular positions in the history of ideas with, with the goal of forming a vision of the moral architecture of the next steps in the revolutionary project. Uh, and uh, we are motivated in this struggle mm. by a reward. What is the reward? The reward, the reward is very close to what Emerson describes in these essays. The mm. reward is to come more fully into the possession of life. Mm. So that we live. Uh, in the present, we, we, uh, we're not asleep. Uh, and uh, therefore, in relation to death, that we die, but only once. So uh, that's really just a, a step, uh, Cornell, in, our, in, our, in what I hope here will be our continuing discussion throughout the semester. Mm. Sounds like more than a step. You got a lot of dimensions, assets, facets. We got a question at the back out there, brother. Jump right in. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Indeed. You're talking about the Occupy movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. the Occupy movement. Yeah. 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 Yes, but, here, but, but, but here's the element in what you say that, that I think deserves special, special emphasis. Uh, 
So a, uh, a conventional picture of the situation, the moral and social situation, is there's the established regime. And then there are the defiers, or the disruptors, mm -hmm. who are these isolated individuals who have then can have this Promethean or romantic self-understanding. So Tocqueville or John Stuart mm -hmm. Mill or Emerson say, these democracies have increased equality, but they're a nation of sheep. They're a nation of conformists. And then they're the, the, the isolated prophet with the gospel of disruption or defiance, then becomes somehow perversely a part of this picture, uh, is, is naturalized. We have the regime, but we have our defiers or our disruptors. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation that we would have to get beyond, both politically and morally. And it then requires us to to, to, to move to a stage ahead of this, uh, the, this idea of disruption. We need actually a program, both on the political side and on the moral side. And the content of the moral program cannot be simply disruption and inconformity. It has to have a content. Uh, and the content cannot be formulated in the language of the universalistic rules which are almost the entire subject matter of the academic metaethics. That, that's the issue mm. that mm. seems to me to be at the heart of this, mm. Mm. Of this conversation. But, but I also detected it in this kind of Will Rogers um, insight in what you were saying. You know, Will Rogers, any, any organization that would take me must have something profoundly wrong about it. That is to say, there's no space for an Emersonian individual in an organization to the degree to which that organization would not end up policing, being dogmatic, and try to provide certain contours for its territory. So even in the abolitionist movement, when Garrison burns the Constitution, Douglas leaves. Major break. Right? Garrison says it's a, it's a slaveholding institution. Douglas says it has a potential, but it's been used in that way, has a potential to be something else. So you break. That is to say, there's going to be certain dogmatic formulations of any organization that holds it together, and Emerson's going to be over against that. There's, therefore, there'll be Emersonian voices in an organization, but it won't be Emersonian all the way down, and you never have an organization. You're not going to have a marriage either. Emersonian marriage is going to be chaotic. Sooner or later, you're going to have to have some rules. Look, honey, we got to work this thing. Well, it's going to be dogmatic for the moment, but it's got to have some way so we can proceed and work through these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Some way of eating, some way of proceeding. There has to be repetition, routine, because that's part of life. The question becomes, what role would an Emersonian voice individual figure self play within that context? And that could be a communist party, it could be a church, a mosque, a synagogue. You can't have any of these organizations without some policing of the boundaries. And the policing of the boundaries are going to be certain things you can't call into question. You see? And yet, Emerson wants that newness to forever be at work for the transformation, the reformation of those organizations across the board, no matter how micro-social, no matter how macro-social. So I mean, to get at your question in terms of its relation to Emerson, I think is very important. I know there was another hand over. Uh, well, no, I think you've already spoken about it. In the back. Mm -hmm. A little louder, please. 
Well, I, I think that it's very important in this discussion to distinguish the political from the personal, which you just now in this remark seem to have combined in some way. Uh, so with respect to the political, all fundamental change is change in the institutional arrangements and the ideological assumptions. That's what you could call the regime. The, the regime is an institutional and ideological structure. It's a set of institutions represented under certain ideas. And the supreme object of political ambition is always the maintenance or the transformation of the regime. So uh, what I'm saying is that the, the political project of the construction of agency depends on institutional innovations. And those innovations we undertake to answer your question about motives or interests for many reasons, not just out of this general spiritual interest in vivification, in vivifying ourselves. For example, uh, take the debate about the dissemination of the advanced practice of production in the United States. Uh, the United States is the major economy in the world in which this knowledge economy is most established. Nevertheless, it is confined. It is quarantined to narrow sectors of the system of production. And this is a fundamental cause, not only of economic inequality, but also of economic stagnation. Now, how could there not be relative stagnation in, in the rise of productivity if the most productive practice is confined? So the motives that we have for transformation are complicated, real world motives because we want inclusive economic growth rather than uh, a form of growth that is debt and credit fueled and then depends on a perverse relation to other economies in the world like China that export trade and capital surpluses. That's the real world. But it turns out that those transformations that we undertake for these material reasons also have a higher significance and value. They expand in economic life the forms of production that are closest to the imagination. And to that extent, the economy ceases to be simply a terrain of constraint and becomes as well a terrain of liberation. Now, uh, then on the personal side, why do we reorient ourselves in this way? What is the fundamental motivation? The fundamental motivation is life, is to be alive, is to have this capacity for action, to be able to turn the tables on the structure that you're in. And that is the most fundamental good, or if you like, it comes before good and evil, because it's, it's, it's the condition for everything. And, and then we begin to relate that fundamental interest to a set of more particular interests. So uh, I, I think that the more we develop this, this picture, the less it seems to be supernal or otherworldly. And it becomes anchored in a whole range of our practical and material interests. It's far too. 
I don't, but I don't think that the event you describe is an example of the problem that you cite, because uh, the issue is mobilization is not structural change. I was speaking about the acceleration of structural change. So mobilization is an element or a condition. But always in political activity, the crucial question is, what is the institutional legacy? If you have mobilization coming in waves, coming and going, it, 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 it has no future unless it leaves an institutional legacy. Now, No, no, because I think, I think we, we have inherited from the history of social theory a false idea of what structural change looks like. So we think in the following binary way. This is Marxism, for example. We have these systems, like capitalism or socialism, and when they change, they change all of a piece. So basically, on this view, there are only two kinds of politics. There's systemic substitution, the substitution of one system for another, revolution. Or there's the reformist management of a system. But that's not what real politics is like. Real structural change is almost always fragmentary. And it can nevertheless be revolutionary if, in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. Hmm. So, the, how are we freer? We're, we're, so the, the situation of political enslavement is one in which we have two starkly divided sets of experiences or moves. We have the routine moves that we make within a framework of institutions and assumptions that are taken for granted. And then under the provocation of crisis in the form of war or economic ruin, we have transformations of the structure. But there's a complete division between these two. Now, how would we be freer or more powerful? We would be freer or more powerful if the piecemeal transformation of the structure were a more natural and continuous extension of the ordinary moves that we make within the framework, as a result of which we no longer need trauma as the condition of transformation. Now, we're out of time. Mm, mm, mm. 303. You got to get through these after. Yes, undergraduates, please pick up your paper assignment. Absolutely. What do you Good think? Stuff. Good stuff. Good oh, stuff. I wish we had more time. Yeah, but that's the problem with the real philosophical discussion. Take it out. I know. I know.